tonight I'm going to be reading to you the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, chapter 14. It's called The Triumph of the Witch. And remember, in chapter 13, the witch said that she had a claim on Edmund's blood. So that meant she owned him and she could do what she wanted. So we're going to find out in chapter 14 what actually happens. As soon as the witch had gone, Aslan said, We must move from the place at once. It will be wanted for other purposes. We shall encamp tonight at the fords of Baruna. Of course, everyone, everyone was dying to ask how he had arranged matters with the witch, but his face was stern and everyone's ears were so ringing with the sound of his roar that nobody dared. So do you remember that Aslan and the witch had a talk and nobody really knows what they talked about? After, after a meal which was taken in the open air on the hilltop, for the sun had got strong by now and dried the grass, they were busy for a while, taking the pavilion down and packing things up. Before two o'clock, they were on the march and set off in a northeasterly direction, walking at an easy pace, for they had not far to go. During the first part of the journey, Aslan explained to Peter his plan of campaign. As soon as she has finished her business in these parts, he said, the witch and her crew will almost certainly fall back to her house and prepare for a siege. You may or may not be able to cut her off and, and prevent her from reaching it. Then he went on to outline two plans for the battle, one for fighting the witch and her people in the wood and another for assaulting her castle. And all the time he was advising Peter how to conduct the operation, saying things like, you must put your centaurs in such and such a place, or you must post scouts to see that she doesn't do so and so. Till at last, Peter said, but you will be there yourself, Aslan. I can give you no promise of that, answered the lion. And he continued giving Peter his instructions. For the last part of the journey, it was Susan and Lucy who saw the most of him. He did not talk very much and seemed to be to them to be sad. It was still afternoon when they came down to the place where the river valley had widened out and the river was broad and shallow. This was the fords of Baruna, and Aslan gave orders to halt on this side of the water. But Peter said, Wouldn't it be better to camp on the far side for fear she should try a night attack or anything? Aslan, who seemed to have been thinking about something else, Roar aroused himself with a shake of his magnificent mane and said, Eh? What's that? Peter said it all over again. No, said Aslan in a dull voice, as if it didn't matter. No, she will not make an attack tonight. And then he sighed deeply. But presently he added, All the same, it was well thought of. That is how a soldier ought to think. But it doesn't really matter. So they proceeded, proceeded to pitch their camp. Aslan's mood affected everyone that evening. Peter was feeling uncomfortable, too, at the idea of fighting the battle on his own. The news that Aslan might not be there had come as a great shock to him. Supper that evening was a quiet meal. Everyone felt how different it had been last night or even that morning. It was as if the good times, having just begun, were already drawing to their end. This feeling affected Susan so much that she couldn't get to sleep when she went to bed. And after she had lain counting sheep and turning over and over, she heard Lucy give a long sigh and turn over beside her in the darkness. Can't you get to sleep either, said Susan. No, said Lucy. I thought you were asleep. I say, Susan. What? I've got a most horrible feeling, as if something were hanging over us. Have you... Because, as a matter of fact, so have I. Something about Aslan, said Lucy. Either some dreadful thing is going to happen to him, or something dreadful that he's going to do. There's been something wrong with him all afternoon, said Susan. Lucy, what was it that he said about not being with us at the battle? You don't think he could be stealing away and leaving us tonight, do you? Where is he now, said Lucy. Is he here in the pavilion? I don't think so. Shh, Susan, let's go outside and have a look around. We might see him. All right, let's, said Susan. 
we might just as well be doing that as lying awake here. Very quietly, the two girls groped their way among the other sleepers and crept out of the tent. The moonlight was bright and everything was quite still except for the noise of the river chatting over the, the, over the stones. And then Susan suddenly caught Lucy's arm and said, Look, on the far side of the camping ground, just where the trees began, they saw the lion slowly walking away from them into the wood. Without a word, they, they both followed him. He led them up the steep slope out of the river valley and then slightly to the right, apparently by the very same route that they had used that afternoon in coming from the hill of the stone table. On and on he led them, into dark shadows and out into the pale moonlight, getting their feet wet with the heavy dew. He looked somehow different from the Aslan they knew. His tail and his head hung low, and he walked slowly as if he were very, very tired. Then, when they were crossing a wide open place where there were no shadows for them to hide in, he stopped and looked around. It was no good trying to run away, so they came toward him, and when they were closer, he said, Oh, children, children, why are you following me? We couldn't sleep, said Lucy, and then felt sure that she needed to say no more and that Aslan knew all they had been thinking. Please, may we come with you wherever you're going? asked Susan. Well, said Aslan, and seemed to be thinking. Then he said, I should be glad of company tonight. Yes, you may come if you promise to stop when I tell you, and after that leave me to go on alone. Oh, thank you, thank you, and we will, said the two girls. Forward they went again, and one of the girls walked on each side of the lion, but how slowly he walked, and his great royal head drooped so that his nose nearly touched the ground. Presently he stumbled and gave a low moan. Aslan, dear Aslan, said Lucy. What is wrong? Can't you tell us? Are you ill, dear Aslan? asked Susan. No, said Aslan. I am sad and lonely. Lay your hands on my mane so that I can feel you are here and let us walk like that. And so the girls did what they would never have dared to do without his permission, but what they had longed to do ever since they first saw him, buried their cold hands in the beautiful sea of fur and stroked it, and doing so, walked with him. And presently they saw that they were going with him up the slope of the hill on which the stone table stood. They went up at the side where the trees came furthest up, and when they got to the last tree, it was one that had some bushes about it, Aslan stopped and said, Oh, children, children, here you must stop, and whatever happens, do not let yourselves be seen. Farewell. And both the girls cried bitterly, though they hardly knew why, and clung to the lion and kissed his mane and his nose and his paws and his great sad eyes. Then he turned from them and walked out onto the top of the hill, and Lucy and Susan, crouching in the bushes, looked after him, and this is what they saw. And that ends part one.